This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com. This show is brought to you by IndieWrestling.us. Check out IWC, RWA, and more. And listeners like you, support this show at Patreon.com slash Wrestling Mayhem Show. It is the Indie Mayhem Show. I'm Mike Sorg at Sorgatron on the Twitter here in the Sorgatron Media Studios in Pittsburgh, PA. And this is the show where we talk with people in and around independent professional wrestling. You can check out so much of uh, what we have going on at WrestlingMayhemShow.com. This and other podcasts and other great wrestling content is happening over there. And a lot of the people we talk with on the show you can find over at IndieWrestling.us and IndieWrestling.network. Uh, just look up a lot of that guest list and you can find a lot of them in action on VOD or subscription on those websites. And we thank everybody that do support the show in those manners. And also you can drop us a line at goodtimes at wrestlingmayhemshow.com at 412-206-WMS0 and let us know if you have any questions for people that we have coming up uh, on the uh, on the schedule over at IndieWrestling.us's Facebook page and Wrestling Mayhem Show's Facebook page. Or if you have anybody you'd like us to talk with on this show, we do take some recommendations over there. So so our guest this week, again, it was a perfect nexus. We we, we just wrapped um, recording a Bold Sports Pittsburgh Super Bowl thing to time us here. And uh, this gentleman, you will find out why that connection uh, works out so well. But Happy Hour is with us in the studio today. By the way, sporting a Barrel Club shirt. And we'll talk a little bit about those connections in a little bit there. How are you doing, Matt? Doing great. Happy to be here, man. I mean, just like you said, you know, bringing my prize winning smile, brought some beer and uh, bringing a happy attitude to go with it. <laughs> Excellent. So um, we like to, of course, break the ice a little bit with, a, a you know, a, a, with the first question here on the show. Uh, first of all, what is your earliest memory of uh, pro wrestling? Earliest memory? Well, uh, I would say... The first time I actually watched wrestling was probably around 1984-ish. That was right when the uh, Macho Man Tito Santana feud was uh, happening. So I remember that match where uh, Danny Davis was the referee and Macho Man uh, used a foreign <laughs> object to win the IC title from uh, Tito Santana. Was that was that um, pre? So was that when we were when when Danny Davis was rolling into Dangerous Danny Davis? Uh, yeah, he rolled into Dangerous Danny Davis like right around eighty six, eighty seven. Yeah, so because it was you know again like that age picking up like wrestlemania 3 and be like yep like what is with this like former referee that, that's a wrestler mm. that's a thing that can happen uh -huh. you know, versus today what we know about wrestlers oh yeah <laughs> but i mean you know the thing is it's like you know you have that heel referee after danny davis it kind of went away until it became a regularity again with nick patrick as the nwo ref and it, and it seemed like every indie promotion had one for the longest time right? oh yeah <laughs> so that's awesome mm -hmm. so how did you go from there to um wanting to be in the ring when's your first inkling where you're like that's a thing i want to do you know the funny thing is uh unlike most professional wrestlers i didn't go into it uh the same way mm -hmm. i actually this i entered wrestling in june of 1995 and uh, I was in a situation uh, where I just flunked out of college and I was just like, man, I got to figure out what I can do. Back then, I was a physically large person. When I say large, I'm talking I probably weighed a good 260, 265 at about 8 to 9 percent body fat. Jeez. I was benching 400 plus back then. OK. And uh, so I was like, you know what? I'm big. I'm built. Let me give professional wrestling a go. I mean, I started with, uh, you know, doing security. I was a bouncer. Uh, event security. I was like, I got to do something to kind of get out there a little more. Mm -hmm. So I decided to give wrestling a go. Well, for some of these indies in Georgia, I was actually in Atlanta at the time. So in the suburbs of Atlanta, there were some indies that were like, hey, man, he looks uh, like he's got great size, great build. Let's do something with him. So, you know, I'm going to admit here back then I was put into the ring basically for a look. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was basically given the most rudimentary of training. Like, you know, they taught me the basics of things, but I was not given like full fledged proper wrestling academy training. I was just basically uh, situated to uh, showcase my size, strength and uh, 
you know, help make uh, other wrestlers uh, look good by taking on a guy my size. Mm-hmm. Because indie wrestling, you're not going to get guys that were built like me uh, a dime a dozen, particularly in the indies. No, no. That you see on the top shelf. Yeah. So uh, it was the wrong voices telling me, hey, we can help make you famous. And I was like, ooh, I want to be famous. And we're talking, you know, in 1995, I was around 20 years old. And I'm just like, yeah, let's do this. And this is, this is, I mean, Atlanta, that's WCW town there. Right. So, I mean, like wrestling, I, I imagine wrestling is, it, 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 was it kind of a hotbed for wrestling because of that vibe with WCW in town? Yes, because, I mean, you know, back in the 90s, you know, when you had uh, down south, you know, you had like, you know, your Smoky Mountains and your Dixie wrestling yeah. and whatnot. You had your Southern territories and WCW was kind of becoming like the top shelf uh, to kind of centralize and create uh, a hot bed for Southern wrestling. And uh, that's why I, and that's kind of what I was led to uh, believe. Hey, if I become famous, I could be on WCW someday. That's awesome. That's, <laughs> and it, it, I mean, the, the, it, it sounds like you're kind of the other story because you always hear about like, you know, guys like maybe Kevin Nash were seen as a bouncer and they grabbed them and said, hey, you should be a wrestler coming out of the power plant or something. So yeah. this is basically kind of seems like what happened with you. But, you know, on the indie, ver- like not straight to the power plant version of it. Right. Exactly. I didn't uh, get that uh, kind of luxury. The other <laughs> thing is. uh one thing that seems to be hard, uh, especially uh, down south in those days, uh, being a minority, mm-hmm. you get typecast into certain roles. and uh, Especially in that region. In that yeah. region, you get very typecast. And one thing that I decided I was uh, never going to do was allow myself to be typecast. I came close. Uh, I didn't allow myself to be typecast because I preserved my character. I mean, I'm, it'll come up as we go through this uh, interview, but there was one scenario where I actually did team up with someone who was typecast, but I got to preserve my character and uh, was allowed to you know, point out that I'm doing this for my own reasons, not because mm-hmm. I'm in league with him. Uh, tell me a little bit about what you were doing down there. Then. So you weren't happy hour at this time. This is comes right. much later in your career. Yep. Uh, a little more recently. So it's like, you know, what were you known as, you know, and what, what, what <laughs> other than being like the big, the big guy that, that made everybody look good. Like what, sure. what, what, what were you doing? You know, the funny thing is, yeah, I, I think back my original debut, uh, they were going for the Mexican look. So my original debut, I had a mask on mm-hmm. and I was called El Cid. Uh, El Cid. El Cid. Okay. Yep. And I think I have an old profile picture on Facebook where I'm in a group photo with a few other uh, masked luchadors. And, uh, you know, just for <laughs> reference, for anyone who finds that pic, I'm the dude in the back in the Garfield t-shirt. So... <laughs> 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 because I hate Mondays, but uh, anyway, well, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, after a, a little bit of the El Cid experiment, and I was like, you know what? I just don't have uh, the we, kind of we call style it the El Cid, the El Cid project. <laughs> exactly, I call it the El Cid project because it was short lived. Yeah. They decided, you know what? You're big. We're gonna start going with like a bruiser style of gimmick. So I then became uh, Brett Striker. But then I later found out there was already a guy in the Indies named Brett Stryker. So then I became Brett Fury. <laughs> hey, is, it never, it never, you know, uh, you know, there's two Matt Strikers. Uh. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's the other thing. I, the one thing I don't want is uh, for there to be identity confusion. See, nowadays it's easier to distinguish because we have uh, yeah. things like smartphones, internet, social media. Back then, uh, you know, we were still phasing out rotary phones, and uh, internet was only a thing for college kids uh, back then. So, and, and even even the wrestling, I think the wrestling discussion on the internet was most like message board text based like it IRS. was it was not easy to uh, uh deal with images to even see this oh, is this guy you know or, or it takes 20 minutes to load up this 12k uh, yeah. gif yeah. You, uh, just, you just watch it rolling down your screen exactly. you're like oh the uh, old days and of and there's the feet oh man netscape mosaic yes <laughs> <laughs> now that we're all showing our age yeah uh, exactly <laughs> so so um uh and it was that pretty much the the, the character for the, your run down there. Yeah, actually, most of my career, uh, I was Brett Fury. Uh, you know, down south, I also wrestled. Uh, when I ended up uh, moving up to Michigan uh, around uh, 2000, I uh, ended up 
wrestling a little in Michigan, not so much. Uh, I made my trips back down south to keep it going because uh, early on I started in Atlanta. I did uh, Georgia and Carolinas. Then uh, I ended up going to school at LSU, so I was wrestling around Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. Uh, and then uh, I got a job offer up in Michigan, so I dabbled in it uh, mm -hmm. while I was in Michigan because I finally was getting my life on track. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, career-wise, uh, while I was in Michigan, I finally graduated from college, got my career, but I couldn't let go of the wrestling bug. Mm -hmm. So I, I did it every now and again uh, just because uh, I enjoyed it. I, you know, it's funny. I got into wrestling with one idea, and now I'm even now – almost 24 years in i do it because i just have so much fun with it mm -hmm. i love being someone in the ring uh you know just the vibe the atmosphere uh relating to the fans it is just so much fun but anyway to go back uh, to the original point so i was brett fury uh until 2010 when uh i had a match in minnesota that i'm not minnesota i'm sorry uh, mississippi in mississippi i had my retirement match and the reason i retired in mississippi the one time i got to be world heavyweight champion was in the late 90s in mississippi for gulf states extreme uh gsx uh and uh i figured you know what if i'm going to retire i'm going to retire uh in the state where I got to be world heavyweight champion. So uh, I took a match. It was a tag team match uh, with a promotion in Mississippi uh, near the Gulf Shores, actually. I uh, wrestled that match, and I thought I was uh, retired for good. Then uh, about a year and a half after that, I got divorced. And, uh, you know, when you, have, when you actually have... Uh, fresh life or new life you decide to reinvent yourself mm -hmm. so you know i started going back to the gym eating right got into great shape and decided you know what i i retired brett fury but i do want to come back into the ring so uh, i'm that's when b furious was born b furious b furious like the letter b furious correct okay yep be furious uh and uh, There's the, there has to be there has to been some kind of battle cry for bill be furious am i right like, no. oh gosh <laughs> no i it, actually the t-shirt motto was uh be true be strong be, be focused furious. be furious <laughs> yeah that's no, amazing i love no, it that was a great t-shirt uh I still have one left, but yeah, that was uh, pretty good with the crowds. And this was when I was in South Carolina. So uh, nice. there was a gentleman. Uh, he was a, a fairly well-known manager uh, down south. His uh, gimmick was the governor, Buff Burton. And uh, he had good relationship with uh, Jay Eagle, uh, who runs a promotion down there. So Jay Eagles wrestled pretty much everyone in the NWA back in the 80s. And Jay Eagles, well known amongst uh, veteran wrestlers. Uh, and Jay Eagle still wrestles every now and again. Uh, the guy's in his 60s, and he still has a great passion <laughs> for it. And uh, I love the guy. He's one of the nicest people I've met. Uh, he basically gave me an open invite to come to his promotion and wrestle anytime. Such a nice guy. And I think so many people really should just stop and listen to his stories because he tells some great stories about wrestling. And, you know, you can sit down and listen to him like, you know, listening to that grandpa you love. Uh, you know, he can tell you some great things, some great laughs, some great lessons learned. Uh, and I mean, that's kind of what I'm uh, getting, even though I'm in my 40s now. Mm. I'm Still, uh, when I get together with some of these old legends, I love to just sit back and hear what they have to say, talk about uh, days long past and stuff like that. But again, I, I think you'll find that I have this habit of digressing a lot. Uh, but uh, <laughs> be furious. So uh, Buff uh, Governor uh, talked me into coming back. He wanted to start his promotion, XPW, uh, Extreme Pro Wrestling in the Carolinas. So he was getting that back up and he uh, wanted to get me on board and talk me into coming back. So uh, Be Furious made a comeback. Uh, or I'm sorry, I guess Be Furious made his debut with uh, 
promotions that he was affiliated with before mm-hmm. XPW came to life. So he brought XPW uh, to life, and uh, we've had some uh, notable uh, stars. I mean, indie stars. Uh, James Drake has been on. Scotty Matthews has been on. We've had Big Country Rob Wardway, Kevin Phoenix. Uh, we've had, uh, oh, Rob Killjoy. Uh in fact, this when they were on, this was back when the Killjoy, uh, Rob Killjoy, James Drake feud was one of the hottest feuds in indie wrestling uh, back in the day. Uh, so, uh, you know, had that opportunity. So I got to uh, get in and learn uh, with some folks. Also, the amazing Velvet, uh, who I will talk more about as we go, uh, who is a really, really important person uh, in my life. That's how I got to meet the amazing Velvet. The amazing Velvet uh, trained uh, under Susan Green back in the 90s, uh, trained under Susan Green and uh, Judy Tex Martin. I'm sorry, Judy Martin and Susan Tex Green. And uh, Judy Martin, for those of you who are aware of old uh, WWF history, yeah, Judy Martin is one of the toughest ladies around. And the two of them, uh, they uh, basically did everything they could to break Velvet down and prove, make him prove that he really wanted it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they would wrestle him on shows and uh, they would do a number on him. So uh, the stories uh, from them are great too. But uh, so that's how I got in touch with the Amazing Velvet. So uh, December of 2015 in Georgia uh, was where I planned on retiring because Georgia was where I broke in. Plan on retiring again. Again, (laughs) exactly. So December 2015, uh, I got to wrestle Cody McCulley. And I bring this up because now he's sort of a breakout star in uh, the Georgia Indies right now. And uh, yeah, he wrestles on shows with uh, Justin Legend, uh, Chris Nelms. Uh, he's been on shows with guys like Logan Creed. Uh, so yeah, definitely, I'm really happy for him. But my retirement match uh, was against Cody McCulley. And uh, it was a botched finish where I was supposed to go over, but he went over uh, because the ref uh, forgot his cue. And uh it all worked out in the end because uh, the promoter really didn't like Cody and wanted to bury uh, Cody. So the fact that he got over on me, who uh, the wrestler at that particular promotion, I had never been pinned. Mm-hmm. I uh, had lost on a countout, and my tag team partner was pinned uh, when we lost the tag champs, uh, the tag championships. But I had never been pinned in that promotion. And that promotion, Cody McCulley, uh, got to pin me uh, on my uh, send-off, and he's been doing great in the Indies since. So that's the uh, life and times of uh, Be Furious right there. (laughs) And uh, my wife, who was my then-girlfriend, was happy that I was retiring. (laughs) (laughs) And then it comes back around here. So, so you required, you you retired in 2015. Mm -hmm. I started seeing you in the Pittsburgh area here last year, I think. Mm -hmm. So, and 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 immediately. So, uh, let me. From my side, I'm going to a, uh, a fight society show because one of the few that I didn't until recently have at work. So I like right. to go watch wrestling. Sure, you know when I'm not you know involved with the camera. Sure, and uh, and uh, and this guy comes out uh, named Happy Hour <laughs> with and uh, and again you're looking I'm just like it. Wait a minute, there's a brewing company on his trunks, and he comes out with beer. So I'm, immediately I'm 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 messaging my friends that should I drink that. I'm like, have you seen the have you seen this stuff? He's like, he's, they're like, yeah, I've heard of this guy. So. Happy hour is happy hour and is, you know, connected with Fury Brewing Company, which is here in Pittsburgh. And this this like menagerie of connections kind of happened here in the last couple of weeks here to get you get everybody in here for for another thing with uh, Bold Sports Pittsburgh here on Super Bowl Sunday. How did happy hour come about? Well, it, it's a it's sort of a perfect storm that uh, touches on so many different things to come together. So uh, my wife and I, we moved to Pittsburgh in mid-2016. Mm-hmm. So this was literally six months after I had just retired in Georgia. Yeah. Uh, what happened was early in 2016, uh, for one year, we lived in Houston, and we came uh, after that one year in Houston to here. And but no wrestling in Houston, right? I did not <laughs> wrestle in Houston. However... 
However, this is where the tie-in comes. So the amazing Velvet is one of my best friends, yeah. probably my uh, best friend in wrestling. And he and another friend who was involved in uh, our promotion uh, in South Carolina, they visited me out in Houston. And we're like, hey, let's go do the Booker T uh, camp. Because Booker T has his uh, yep. academy and promotion just outside of Houston. This is very particularly why I wanted to say, like, so no wrestling in Houston. I hear right. there's a lot of it. So uh, we went to the fantasy camp and uh, we actually did the full uh, tryout because, I mean, you know, none of us were, we knew we weren't what they were looking for for tryouts, but they had everybody in the camp do the complete tryout and show because they were actually going to pick two winners uh, mm -hmm. from that uh, camp uh, to actually get. Uh, several months of free uh, training at Booker T school. Uh, so, but we went through the full tryout and uh, the bug kind of bit me uh, mm. because I was like, holy crap, uh, went through that. And RVD was there too uh, that weekend. So me, Velvet, Booker T, RVD, and also uh, Bruce Pritchard was uh, there that weekend too. So we were all telling stories, you know, talking about wrestling. Uh, talk, uh, Velvet was telling a lot of stories about Susan Green. Uh, Bruce Pritchard's good friends with Susan Green. And, uh, the funny part is actually during the tri at the end there was an optional part so this wasn't part of the tryout uh they basically said hey everybody who wants to take a suplex from rob barnhart line up so velvet velvet's uh 50 years old now and uh <laughs> he basically he whispers to barnhart post me up watch watch this so uh barnhart goes to hold up velvet and velvet's just like yeah now i'm holding this post so standing soup a good 30 seconds, uh, just posted up balanced uh, in the suplex position before he went down. So Velvet was trying to be a show off to all the kids in the camp. And, uh, you know, it was, I think what was really encouraging for me was the fact that a number of the people at the camp uh, ended up throwing up in the trash can part mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. uh, and I made it through and uh, Velvet made it through. And I mean, the Velvet's a few years older than me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, uh, that's when we started talking and we got to make something happen. So, uh, uh, near the end of, uh, 2016 velvet, uh, myself and another person, we talked about, uh, bringing back wrestling in Charleston, South Carolina. So that's when they started. Uh, it started first as brewery championship wrestling because we were wrestling in breweries and bars uh, and then eventually became battleground championship wrestling. But that's actually 2015 with XPW. We did several shows uh, at Frothy Beard Brewing Company in Charleston, South Carolina. So that's how I started the wrestling and brewery connection. Okay. So I'm sorry I left that detail out, but that's actually how I started. Frothy Beard Brewing Company now has a larger facility in Charleston. And uh, yeah, Brewery Championship Wrestling ran uh, a show there. And uh, it was uh, something amazing as far as the vibe was concerned. But now getting to happy hour. So uh, I decided... Yeah, thought about it, but I'm here in Pittsburgh now, so I, I can't really get too involved down there so much. Then I started looking online and saw PWX Academy. And I was like, that's like 20 minutes from my house. <laughs> Why not? I, I actually uh, you know, reached out to them and they said, yeah, come on in for a tryout. I did a try. Quinn Magnum. Uh, Quinn Magnum, I'm going to name him as a very, very meaningful person, mm -hmm. uh, in my wrestling life because Quinn gave me a chance. He could have been like some of the other folks taking my money for a tryout and said, get out of here, you old fart. Mm -hmm. No, Quinn gave me a chance, gave me a legit opportunity. And, uh, I passed the tryout. And, uh, one thing I did learn in uh, that tryout, uh, it was a pretty tough tryout, but I learned that I needed to get in better shape. Mm. So that's something I did. Uh, I worked on cardio, lifting weights. I, since moving to Pittsburgh, I've probably dropped about 60 pounds and uh, gotten shape to where, you know what, I can actually uh, wrestle without being a risk. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, I uh, went to uh, training for, it was PWX then, then eventually transitioned to Fight Society. And I made my Fight Society debut uh, last June. And uh, that was a great feeling. I mean, you know, I in training, I got to work on building up the happy hour character, 
Quinn was great about uh, giving me ideas. I mean, uh, you know, when I see Quinn, I call him coach mm -hmm. uh, because to me, that's who he is. Uh, mm -hmm. He's coach. And, uh, you know, what coach says goes. Coach says do something, I'll do it. Uh, you know, that's the kind of uh, feeling I have and the loyalty that I have to Quinn Magnum. I think it's fascinating that you're, you know, been in the business for so long, but still like going for tryouts and, you know, went through the training school and everything, too. Like, is that because of the kind of uh, lackluster pointers you gave at the begin? you were given at the beginning and you're kind of still like building those skills up and rebuilding those skills up? You know, the hard part is you don't know what you don't know. Right. And that was what I suffered from because no one took me aside and said, hey, this mm -hmm. is what you need to do. I was basically passed off from one promotion to another. And a key point that'll put it in perspective is that uh, Brett Fury... Uh, had lost every single match he wrestled between 2000 and 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, my first match back as B Furious was a loss. So I did not win a wrestling match uh, between the years 2000 and mid-2014, just to put in perspective. Wow. I was basically, uh, the reason I kept getting booked uh, it was twofold. One, uh, I agree to a booking, I show up to a booking. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the fact that, uh, you know, no one has to wonder where I'm at, uh, promoters are very happy th with the fact that, Hey, you're going to be here. I show up, uh, that's the first thing that makes them happy. I show up, I will be there early. I'll help set up if I can, I'll help tear down if need be. And the fact that I do that makes promoters super happy. So, you know, regardless of what my skill level was, they're like, you know what? That's a set of hands that I can rely on. Mm -hmm. That's one. Two, uh, a lot of these promoters, uh, they looked at me as an opportunity to put over new young talent that they want to showcase. So, you know, I've had matches where I've taken on a 17-year-old uh, who needed to look good against a guy bigger than him. Uh, I've had, uh, you know, I've basically been enhancement talent in every which way possible. Hmm. And okay, back now to Happy Hour. We got a character. We're debating right. in June. How did you get connected with an actual brewery here in Pittsburgh? Then, all right. Well, the story with uh, me and Fury Brewing Company. Well, uh, Fury Brewing Company opened almost two years ago, March of 2017, and uh, it was about 15 minutes from my house. And I was like, you know what? There's a brewery nearby. Let me give this a try. So I tried it. Most of their beers were not very good. Uh, I decided, you know what? They're nearby. I'm going to go once a month uh, and see how it goes. So uh, Ryan Slicker, who's our head brewer, uh, they brewed a beer. I want to say it was like July or August of 2017. And I said, you know, this is what I taste. This is what I would like to taste. This is where the gap is. Uh, and, you know, Ryan took that constructive criticism. And I went back uh, a month or two later for another round of a similar beer. Uh, and I was like, you know, this is a huge improvement over what I had the last time. So, you know, I started buying into it. I was like, went back again. I was like, Dude, a lot of the beers up there, these are beers I'm actually starting to enjoy. And uh, that's when the uh, president of uh, Fury, Tom Jenkins, he, funny story about Tom Jenkins, he actually went to high school with Dean Radford. Oh. They were actually high school friends. Another local wrestling, wrestling connection legend yeah. here, like in, uh, here in, in Pittsburgh. Yeah, uh, check out the archives for our interview with him. I think we went a good hour because <laughs> usually the guys that have been around for a while here in Pittsburgh, they got we got a good hour of stories out of that. Oh gosh, yes. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, Tom reached out to me and was like, "Hey, uh, you want to help us sell beer?" And I was like, sure. I, now that I enjoy the product, I'm happy to sell it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I got on board and that's how I got on board uh, with Fury. Now, uh, when I got on board with Fury, I still hadn't finalized the happy hour uh, persona. Mm -hmm. I was just uh, thinking of different personas I wanted to pursue. And then it just uh, hit me. You know, I'm a beer guy. Beer comes naturally to me. The persona uh, should be me. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't. Uh, be me pretending to be something I'm not. So here I am. I'm I'm a happy-go-lucky guy. I'll bring the prize-winning smile. I bring the beers, and I get to be me. So for the fans out there who see me, you get to see me for me. And that's that's something that I really really enjoy. You're not just connecting with Happy Hour. You're connecting with me, and uh, that's how how good I feel about it. 
That's awesome. A little bit of footage for you guys on the video version of this. Um, it, it, it's, it's like it's also like kind of a genius crossover too. <laughs> that like you're advertising this to the you know the people in the crowd and everything. Like and that it, it seems like a, a like that's a fun marketing opportunity. Oh, no question about it. I, I mean, uh, you know what I'm hoping to do. Uh, you know, not to name names, but uh, there are certain venues that are uh, beer positive, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what I would love to do is have our beer at that venue and mid-match, I go up for a refill of Fury beer and power up. I would love to do that. That is something that I hope to accomplish this year. <laughs> That's awesome. That's amazing. Uh, how's the response been to like to, to the to this positive character? You know, the, this beer character at these shows. Oh, it's been fantastic. Uh, I'll bring up Fight Society. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, the usual group of folks. I, I think the beer is more over than I am. <laughs> <laughs> it helps. I mean, it helps. Oh, it know. helps. But I, I love it. I, I mean, you know, uh, those guys. Uh, you know, when they've got either the happy hour chant or the alcohol chant. Mm -hmm. uh you know it, it's a fun time just to have that reaction i just uh did a show down in south carolina for battleground championship wrestling and uh the crowd uh was all uh into it uh as far as the beer is concerned or you know when i'm out to make a save or out to uh go recover a fallen comrade and you know even when the kids are like he needs a beer and i'm just like yes <laughs> yes <laughs> teaching them early <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> that's fantastic um i was showing some clips here uh during the show uh, and it's usually a fun like when you come out of fire society there's usually a pretty fun spot like where there was a uh, we were showing the part uh where you and beast man had a uh <laughs> i think this yeah. was was this a gauntlet no, it, yeah that was it, the beast man gauntlet the beast yeah. man gauntlet where like they had beast man which is if you have not seen him look up beast man uh, well he's kind of all over social media these oh, yeah. days uh kind of a, a large caveman character um and uh and he was i think for his birthday or something no, it was a christmas it was gift. a christmas gift that's right yes. he was lined up with just a <laughs> what did joe say uh we're gonna i want to watch you kill these losers <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh yeah and just like you know and i could tell like a couple guys were like trainees or something right it's just poor uh, yeah poor uh uh jonathan lockwood maddox that guy the screamer <laughs> well that was the first guy yeah right? that was the first guy uh yes it was a I, weird like i thought he was like some kind of masochist character it just was just like hit me <laughs> yeah he's more of a serial killer type okay I mean, all right yeah and but yes he is a trainee and uh yep uh, he was the first sacrificial lamb. Now, uh, I guess technically the second sacrificial lamb was uh, uh, Chief Thunderbear's phone. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, yep. yeah. Yeah, hey, if you're going to wear a sports jacket to the ring, make sure you've checked your pockets for right. your $1,000 phone. <laughs> or leave the coat at the coat check, you know? Yes, yes exactly. <laughs> um, and then you come out trying to make friends with him oh, yeah. with the beer. No, absolutely, man. I'm all about, you know, I feel like everything can be settled over some beers. And, you know, I thought things are going okay. But, uh, you know, Beast Man being from deepest, darkest West Virginia, you know, there's no <laughs> there's no telling, uh, you know, what to expect or how he's going to react. No, absolutely. Oh, man. So um, uh, it, it, I think we talked about it. you're not, you know, perhaps maybe watching the main wrestling these days or anything. But is there anything, you know, going to these indies and, and stuff? Is there anybody that you're seeing out there that should, we should be on the watch out for or even or even anybody that you're running into? That's kind of an inspiration to you these days. Well, you know, I'll say a few things. Uh, one, I. I'm a big fan of sizzling Stan Styles. Oh yeah, Stan Styles, uh, and That's I'm going to mention this now. Uh, we booked him for uh, Battleground Championship Wrestling in South Carolina on March 30th because uh, I love your stick. I remember the first time I saw him. It was like a year, uh, a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. and uh, I remember when he did the triple tearaway pants. I died. Mm -hmm. I died mm -hmm. because he camera uh, facing the camera. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh man, this, that alone completely sold me. Uh, I think, uh, it wasn't that match, but, uh, or it might've been that match. He took on beast man, uh, on that show and man. it was fantastic. Fantastic. When beast man got a hold of the shake weight and, uh, started shaking it and Stan was having convulsions. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, there's this, there's this interesting thing happening. I, you know, I, and I think I think you're in this line too. Like uh, you know, I, I saw Beastman on Facebook. Um, you know, talking about like he's watching like 1992 superstars, and like everybody had like an object and a gimmick like with right. them, right? Mm-hmm. And like you're coming out with the beer. Stan Styles has the shake weight. Uh, Beastman has the bone. You know, and plus you're all these like really over the top characters mm-hmm. right like it feels like indie wrestling everybody wants to be like the super indie flippy guy and and like we're getting back to that core that a lot of us grew up to especially in those early 90s right mm-hmm. or late 80s well i mean what was important back in like uh the old school days of wrestling is you knew who they were. You knew uh, there was a cause involved. Uh, you know, the problem with uh, a lot of these uh, flippy guys or these spot guys is <laughs> they invest so much in the spot that uh, you lose touch with who the character is. Right. And uh, they become identified by their spots and less by who they are. Yeah. And I think that's the hard part. I want, you know, I want people to remember who happy hour is. You know what? Like, uh, you know, talking about the scenario where I spit on beast man. You know what? You'll never see that happen again. And I keep forgetting <laughs> everybody else in that match. <laughs> I, and, and I just remember the, 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 the happy hour spot. Oh, you well, know, that's and, just and, and the guy that lost his phone. Phone, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Though I will say props to Chief Thunderbear for getting uh uh, beast man to dance yeah did the travel true. dance with him but yeah uh, I, uh, but poor thunder bear that phone was more over than he was yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh no uh, that being said I, I think it's important that people uh can be identified by their character uh because that's what we're going to remember mm-hmm. uh we remember what they look like we, you know generic person uh wearing trunks who does a 450 splash uh you know, you might see that a dime a dozen mm-hmm. uh, out in the indies. You know, at the least, Sean Phoenix has his fireball gimmick. Yeah. If not for the fireball gimmick and his look, he'd be generic uh, indie guy uh, doing a 450 in trunks. Mm-hmm. But Sean Phoenix, uh, he at least figures out how to make him identifiable. Yeah. And I think that's uh, key for character. That way you become the character and not the moves. Absolutely. Sounds good. What is, say, a long, I think we we touched on a few things here, but what is the best and the worst thing about indie wrestling for you? Well, the best thing has been some of the people I've met. Mm. And uh, a specific story I want to relate, it was actually uh, a few weeks ago when I was in South Carolina. So uh, I actually shared an Airbnb with uh, Stro, Maestro from WCW. Oh. And uh, Maestro. <laughs> yeah. He, I'm, I'm remembering him now. Oh yeah. gosh, yep. Uh, but uh, that the main event of that show was uh, uh, Maestro and uh, Big Hoss. Uh, Big Hoss uh, trained under Susan Green, and Big Hoss is like uh, he competed in World Strongest Man competitions. Uh, he does like 800 pound uh, type uh, squat. Uh, type things. He posted pictures or videos and he squ- uh, lifts some ridiculous weights. But uh, uh, it was him and Stro against uh, Big Game James and L.A. Tink. Now, Big Game James was on WWE TV before. Big Game James is like 6'6", 275, super ripped. L.A. Tink was an ECW original, uh, still wrestles in the indies. He's wrestled a lot of big names. and uh, He's the world heavyweight champion at UPWA down in North Carolina uh, right now. And he and Maestro had a cage match uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, those two guys, uh, they put on uh, quite the fight and they've worked each other a bunch of times so uh you know they know the ins and outs of what they do and they put on a great match now getting to that main event big game james is one of the uh, physically largest guys in the indies you want you know when you have a guy like him 90 percent of the 95 98 percent of the guys in the indies look like dwarves uh Mm -hmm. compared to him now uh in this match big hoss uh just uh, deadlifted big game James and power slammed him like he was nothing. And that's the first time uh, I've ever seen big game James manhandled like he was a rag doll. And that's when my, my mind was just blown because that was my first time actually seeing big Hoss live mm-hmm. velvets uh, trained with big Hoss and has known big Hoss for years. And he's like, no, no, trust me. This guy's legit powerhouse. And when he did that to big game, James, I was like, I mean, a big game James is a guy that would make the main event uh, look a little small. 
Yeah, the main, yeah, the main event, the tower over Mike. Yeah, the main four. event are not small guys, <laughs> no. but Big Game James would make them look like average indie wrestlers, Jeez. just to put in perspective. And when I saw that power slam, <laughs> and we reinforced that ring, we actually added an extra layer of wood because uh, between uh, Big Hoss and L.A. Tank, we're talking like almost seven hundred pounds there Jeez. in the ring. Uh, and we're so like, when they say they reinforced the ring, like they really in- reinforced the ring. <laughs> yeah, we did. I, I mean, you know, when I was taking uh, bumps on that ring, it, it hurt. But was I was like, a, you know what? At least we know when that main event takes place, there won't be a hole in the ring. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's tough to fix those. What's the worst thing about it? <sighs> You know, it's funny. The same thing that's the best thing about it is also the worst thing about it. The best thing are some of the people I've met. The worst thing are some of the people I've met. And I mean, you know, you meet people that come from all walks of life. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, it doesn't matter where you come from. It's a matter of how you treat people. Uh, You know, I've met people who come from... uh, higher end walks of life, uh, who are, you know, college educated people. And some of them are terrific people. And some of them are scumbags. I've met people who grew up in the brokest of broke conditions, but you know, they wear their heart on their sleeve and they would, uh, give you what little they have to keep you from dying. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's just a mixed bag of personal character and personal integrity in the Indies. So, you know, some people want to judge based on, uh, uh, what your background is, uh, but no, it's just, you know, nice people versus uh, those who are just scumbags uh, would be the uh, highs and lows of uh, the best and worst of what I've experienced in uh, indie wrestling. Awesome. Hey, it's been great to watch and film and, and chat with you here. Uh, where can people uh, check you out online and where can they check out the brewery? Well, hey, online, uh, on Facebook, you can go to Wrestler Happy Hour on Twitter. Uh, you can go to FBC Happy Hour. If you want to check out the brewery, uh, there's a Fury Brewing Company page. If you want to check out a crossover of both Happy Hour and Fury Brewing Company, uh, there is a page, uh, Happy Hours Barrel Club, where I will update you on both uh, wrestling and uh, brewery oh, related bring stuff. bring it together. Exactly. Oh, I mean, after all, I'm wearing the uh, Barrel Club shirt and our first barrel uh release is going to be by the end of next month we'll be uh releasing a uh, rye whiskey barrel aged imperial brown ale and it's going to be called dad's nuts (laughs) so get you some dad's nuts I don't even drink beer, and I'm liking this page. I just, I just got to see this stuff. Uh, <laughs> this is great. Like I said, I have a lot of craft beer friends that do podcasts and everything. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's been cool to be to see that cross section and happen here. It's cool that we get some cool stuff that happened here today in the studio with our friends at Bold Sports and Fury Brewing. Uh, please go check out Bold Sports, Bold Sports Pittsburgh and Bold Pittsburgh uh, to see um, that. You guys did talk a little bit about wrestling in there as well. Uh, I'm trying to get Steve from there out to a wrestling show. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so and of course uh, you're here with Fight Society in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, I debuted an Uprise recently. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm with uh, Fight Society Uprise. Uh, I'm uh, also with QCW uh, mm-hmm. in Ohio. Uh, I have some uh, links to uh, Black Diamond. Uh, I will be at the UCW Final Chapter show uh, where uh, the main event will be Billy Gunn versus Beastman. Oof. That should be a great Oof. one. And then, of course, there is uh, EYSW that's uh, debuting later this year. Mm-hmm. And uh, MVP, uh, Monongahela Valley, Mon Valley Professional Wrestling is coming back this year. So I'll be there, too. Yep. So, yeah, you'll see me all around. Uh, this is going. I'm going to be hitting it hard this year. So if you want to see Happy Hour, this is really the year to see me. I, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I'm in my 40s. So after this year, I'm going to tone it down and start acting my age <laughs> oh, come on <laughs> come on um that's great hey hey and and any i think any show with billy Gunn's probably a uh, scouting mission these days with his connections to a certain new promotion out there uh but <laughs> i'm not starting that debate because mad mike started that on the other show uh, <laughs> but thank you so much go check out happy hour and like i said a few of his matches are over on indie wrestling.us and the indie wrestling network indie wrestling us network at indie wrestling.network um and uh please check out the other chat uh if you like this chat and uh, 
and want to see more, go look for the Indie Mayhem Show and your favorite podcaster uh, out there. And, of course, video versions on our YouTube and Facebook pages for Indie Wrestling US and the Wrestling Mayhem Show. Until next time, go support independent craft beer and indie wrestling. Oh. This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.